Your song, my song, our story. Put them all together and their history. Your song, my song, my story. Until now, my story's been a mystery. Non-linear one-liner notes, when will this rave and stop? Not until we've introduced the Chronicles of Pop. John Gilliland's The Pop Chronicles. Now, Chapter 2, The Tribal Drum. The rhythm and blues revolution began in the cities, in the melting pot black ghettos, where many blues forms existed side by side. The phonograph record, and later the radio and the big touring R&B shows, helped push the big beat into all parts of the country. Mama, he treats your daughter me. Mama, he treats your daughter me. Mama, he treats your daughter In some quarters, R&B was fast becoming more polished and popish. It was as though the performers, writers or producers, whatever, had decided, now that the white market has taken a step in our direction, we might as well take a step in theirs. New York City, George Gershwin's hometown, was home base for the sophisticated, jazz-flavored early Atlantic sound. Jubilee, National and Savoy also recorded there. Ahmet Erdogan headed up the Atlantic team. When we first started Atlantic Records, the independent scene was just blossoming, the independent record scene. And at that time, the music that was popular with the people who liked jazz was somehow related to, to the R&B scene. In other words, you had people who bought Billy Eckstein, who also bought Charlie Parker, who also bought Joe Turner, and who also bought uh, uh, Dinah Washington, and... Uh, it was all interwoven. Here comes Fanny walking down the street. She walks so groovy and she talks so sweet. Hey, Miss Fanny, you sure look fine. Tell me, please, will you be my head now? Miss Fanny. Hey, now. Please be mine. But aside from a pronounced and consistent you beat and some uncommonly provocative lyrics, the thing the white kids seemed to dig most in early 50s rhythm and blues was the group sound. Harmonizing in an almost embarrassingly old-fashioned barbershop style and generally relying on vocal gimmicks for their effects, groups with names like the Oreos, Crows, Cardinals, and Penguins, a good many of them had bird names, led the first wave assault on pop. I need it, I need it when the moon is bright. I need it, I need it when you hold me tight. In the middle of the night, I need your honey love. The groups were the undisputed hits of the R&B package shows that crisscrossed America during the last decade. In addition to vocalizing, they delighted the young white segment of their audiences with frenzied acrobatics and choreography, including some overtly sexual visual dramatics. Uh, anybody old enough to remember the flea? Oh, yeah. Honey love, I need. Oh, baby. Honey love, I need. Get it, boy. Honey love, I need. Your honey love. Motown's Smokey Robinson. Back in those days, to me, there were only a couple groups that were really choreographed. I mean, in other words, I think that the other things that the other groups were doing were more or less a, a, a more or less just like a feeling thing. Whatever they felt to do when they were on stage, uh, one guy might feel like running to the other side of the stage and coming back, you know. And uh, this is what was happening. But uh, you take a group like the Cadillacs and the uh, Otis Williams and the Charms, and uh, they were choreographed, polished groups. I would say that uh, had uh, everything was, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why they were so exciting to watch. 
The Clovers, high school chums from the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, recorded their classic One Mint Julep for Atlantic in 1952. One early morning Children from a getting frisky. Oh, a man in julep, a man julep, a man julep, a man julep. What man julep was the cause of it all? They were one of the most consistent hit making groups in all of RB in the 50s, 16 of their records placing on the Billboard chart. The Clover's hits like Little Mama, Hey Miss Fanny, and Lovey Dovey contain vivid examples of the spare and earthy lyrics of the era. Little Mama, I took The 
soldiers headed up a long parade of rhythmic aggregations. Uh, in addition to the aforementioned bird groups, we had the charms, chords, dominoes, five keys, four tunes, spaniels, spiders, and turbans. And as R&B entered its first boom period, some of those group members went out on their own to score as single performers. Clyde McFatter, Benny King, Wilson Pickett, and Jackie Wilson were among the more notable successes. Come out here on the floor. Let's rock some more. When I was singing in church, my favorite vocal group was a group called Billy Ward and the Dominoes. And, um, well, I admired Mr. Ward so much because he didn't do any of the singing, but he had all the brains for the talent. What did he do, arrange them? Played piano, done all arrangements, and he was a vocal coach once at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. So I finally had the pleasure of meeting him, and, um, well, about a year later, I had the pleasure of joining him. Mm -hmm. Now, you were with them how long? About four years. Now, and what I... records that I might have heard that were well, you doing? Well, we had, a. Uh, one called St. Teresa of the Roses, and we also had um, a very big one called Rags to Riches. How, how were these things arranged, Jackie? Were uh, these written down, or were most of these out of the head after? Uh, well, they were all head arrangements. Were we didn't quite know anything about uh, putting music in front of musicians at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. It was all, you add a little bit and let's go get it. You, you know? had some other pretty uh, famous alumni in that group, didn't you, that came uh, out of that yes. group? Clyde McFadder and uh, Gene Mumford. He's the young man that made Stardust. He was originally with the Golden Gate mm -hmm. Quartet. top Clyde McFatter left the Dominoes in 1953 to form a new group, the Drifters. Their debut release on Atlantic, a record that hit number one on all of the rhythm and blues charts, contained many of the elements that pop would later borrow and label rock and roll. There was a, a style which developed on the West Coast, which to us was the, the grooviest sounding R&B music, which was Amos Milburn. Bad, bad whiskey. Well, Charles Brown, you know, was, was, was marvelous. You know, he had a marvelous group, and he made some great records. Well, I'm drifting and drifting Like a ship out on the sea 
we tried to get that sound back east, it wasn't easy. We got something else trying to get that sound, you know, which, which was the, the beginning of the Atlantic sound. And what was that early Atlantic sound? Oscar Moore's guitar playing, you know, was a very important part of it. It was a clean, popish sounding R&B, but deeply imbued with the blues. For example, the first Ruth Brown hits we had uh, with a small group. Well, Jesse Stone was our arranger at that time, and he really developed what became the basic rhythm pattern of rock and roll. You know what I'm saying? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> It's a development from Jimmy Yancey's, you know, bass pattern on the piano. Jimmy Yancey is probably one of the greatest blues artists of our century. Yancey's bass figures are still used by everybody, you know. He's the one who originated the, the, the type of boogie-woogie style on the piano. He's a great blues singer, too. And the first really good singer that, uh, that we got on the label and the first thing that we recorded extensively was Ruth Brown, who was Turn out, you know, turn out to be the, one of the greatest singers of her time. Atlantic found Ruth Brown in a New York bistro where she was singing pop songs. Ahmet Erdogan persuaded her to sing one blues song as a personal favor. During the next 10 years, starting with Teardrops From My Eyes in 1950, Ruth Brown delivered 13 best-selling R&B records, five of them number one songs. Brown, the Clovers, and a hefty, big voice blues shouter from Kansas City made up the nucleus of Atlantic's early success. When we were able to sign up Joe Turner, that was a great coup, in my estimation. He wasn't doing that well, but he was the greatest blues singer that I have ever, ever heard of. Big Joe Turner, also called the boss of the blues, had established some national fame as early as 1938, wailing his Casey style blues from the stage of Carnegie Hall. In 1945, Esquire magazine named Big Joe the country's foremost exponent of the blues. But most of his devotees remember Chains of Love, circa 1950, as the start of it all. Chains of Love has tied my heart to you. had had classical training, he would have been the style of the Metropolitan. He didn't need a microphone. He'd stand in front of a Count Basie's band and 
the, the brass section couldn't overpower it. I'm like a Mississippi bulldog sitting on a hollow stump. I'm like a Mississippi bulldog sitting on a hollow stump. I got so many women, I don't know what you way to jump. Now flip, flop, and fly. I don't care if I die. Now flip, flop, and fly. I don't care if I die. Now don't ever leave me. Don't ever say goodbye. Oh my. The Pop Chronicles continue in a moment. Atlantic had endeavored to capture at least a part of the R&B style of the West Coast, but in the end came up with a distinctively East Coast sound of its own. In 1952, however, Ahmet Erdogan and company signed one of the most promising young blues performers in California. He was a blind, Georgia-born pianist-singer who had settled in Los Angeles. He was to become one of the most versatile and influential Negro singers in the history of pop music. I gamble on your love, baby And got a losing hand I gamble on your love, baby Yes, and got a losing hand Your ways keep changing Like the shift in desert sand Ray Charles first used to record on a label out here in California called Swing Time. We bought his contract. At that time, we didn't have very much money in it, but it was we thought he was the greatest artist around. Although he neither composed nor arranged in his first sessions for Atlantic, some of those Ray Charles sides, particularly losing hand, are blues masterpieces. 1953 and a landmark session in a New Orleans radio station produced the first Charles original songs and arrangements. And for the first time, Ray led his own band. But it wasn't until a year later in Atlanta that the genius charged off on his own truly creative path on records, his fence-busting assault on the old barriers dividing gospel and blues. She's there to love me both day and night Never grumbles or fusses Always treats me right Never running in the streets And leaving me alone She knows a woman's place Is right there now in her home I got a woman Way over town That's good to me Oh yeah Say I got a woman Way over town She's all right. I don't know she's all right. She's all right. She's all right. Ray Charles boldly brought them together. Gospel and blues, the sacred and profane. His was a wailing black potion of jazz, rhythm and blues, and shouting church music. Some people called it soul. You see, I've been playing the way I would play right now for far back as I can remember with the little few alterations. Uh, I, I was a great admirer of Nat Cole, and I used to try to sound like uh, like him on a lot of the popular songs, you know, the, the so-called pop songs that we did. But as far as the, the, the bluesy, rhythmic type things, I've, I've, I've always done that. It's just that you can, you know, you can do something around here and in, in, in this office uh, for two or three years, and maybe nobody will notice it. And then somebody will come along and see what you're doing, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, people say, well, Oh, you just started this yesterday, did you? And you've been doing it for Christ for years, you know. Mm-hmm. But you got to be, you you must be discovered doing it. Mm-hmm. You see, this is, and I think this is what happened. You see, although I had been doing what I was doing for a long time, 
the public was not aware of it. But uh, for instance, I got a woman. We were I was playing. I got a woman long before I recorded it. Clara Ward and the Ward Gospel Singers. And Ray Charles, uh, but he he did it so good, you know. It it was just marvelous the way he just took the same gospel songs and just changed the lyrics. And he was a sensation because uh, yeah, like uh, we sing this little light of mine. This little girl of mine. Yes, I noticed that. Well, oh yeah. Oh well, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Do you know that this little girl of mine? I want you people to know this little girl of mine. I take her everywhere we go. One day I looked at my suit. My suit was new. I looked at my shoes and they were too. And that's why I, 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 I. But there were some who objected to the fusion of the sacred and secular elements in song. One time preacher Big Bill Brunsey said of Ray Charles music, I know that's wrong. He should be singing in church. And the world's greatest gospel singer voiced dismay over the state of gospel music in general. Now when I first started singing, I sang just like it was in the church, an organ and a piano. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just an organ. But now they kept on getting away from the cross till they started putting the drum, they started to put in excitement, started to put in symbols of brass until it don't even sound like gospel. You understand? Gospel has, the people has made it commercial. A gospel music was sang when Jesus was born two thousand years ago. The angels first sang gospel. And there's the song that they sang, Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. No but in no Lord the trouble I see. Body no my sorrow. What do you think about Jesus? He's right. While its message is undisputably old, the style of music that we call gospel today is relatively new. In the 1930s, Thomas Dorsey, an arranger for many of the Louis Armstrong Hot Five jazz sessions, turned religious composer. He and his group in Chicago developed the novel, bluesy style of religious song that was to become the favored music of the Negro Baptist churches during the late 30s and 40s. I think um, gospel singing is something that just, that's just born in you. And you're brought up with it, you never hear anything else. Most of us start going to church when we're babies, you know, our mother takes us in her in our arms. And uh, you, we just don't know anything else. Of course, there's a different generation today. Mm -hmm. But to, as far back as I can remember, every Sunday all day long I was in church and we were singing and uh, it's just a part of me and I, I don't uh, feel anything else. The Pop Chronicles continue in a moment. Even before Ray Charles combined the evil blues music with foot-stomping jubilation shouts and gospel chord progressions, wayward bits and pieces of the gospel song tradition had filtered down into rhythm and blues. In 1953, for example, this secular but soulful Faye Adams single was the second best-selling R&B record in America. Yeah! Yo! 
And the prominent R&B group sound of the 50s probably grew out of the equally conspicuous group style in the churches. You saw me crying in the chapel The tears I shed were tears of joy I know the meaning of contentment Well, this is a thing that I predicted about 13 years ago, I would say, that there will come a time when the popular music will be bridged uh, to the spiritual music. And this is the indication today. It's a spiritualistic inflection to pop music. Maybe I'll never get the credit for starting this type of thing. But uh, that's where it started from You Never Walk Alone and, and songs of this nature. Back in the late 40s, at the outset of his career, Roy Hamilton was just another struggling black singer with a characteristically tough decision to make. Either you scored with the limited Negro audience by sticking to the blues, or you aimed for the larger and far more lucrative white acceptance. In the latter case, you had to do precisely what the Nat Coles, Billy Eckstein's, and Ella Fitzgerald's had done before. You had to sing white pop music. I couldn't get a, a, a chance, a break, because I really had nothing different to offer, and they were seeking uh, blues singers at the time, and I didn't know any blues at all. So for the next five years, he kicked around with a fairly successful gospel group called the Searchlight Singers. The time was well spent. In 1953, when the group broke up and each member went off in his own direction, Roy Hamilton headed back into pop music. At last, he felt he had something different to offer. I just knew about oh, five or six numbers at the time, and um, You Never Walk Alone was one of them, and this was getting the greatest reaction. And I met a, uh, a fellow named Bill Cook, who was a disc jockey at the time. And in fact, he was number two in the whole area of New York and New Jersey. And uh, he took me over to Epic and introduced me to them, and we recorded You Never Walk Alone, and that was it. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of Almost everybody had sung the Rodgers and Hammerstein inspirational classic at one time or another. High school and college glee clubs attacked it with good intentions and quite often disastrous results. 
touring opera stars included it in their concert repertoire, usually for a rousing encore. Even Sinatra and Como recorded it. But up until 1954, no one had ever sung it quite like Roy Hamilton. seemingly uh, took that spiritualistic quality, I imagine, into the popular vein. Mm -hmm. And when I sing a popular song, then it comes out a, a bit different, you know. And this was a new um, era, so to speak, in, in, in uh, musical interpretation. At that time, I imagine the public just seeking something uh, that has a little more soul, you know, mm -hmm. I imagine. Lonely rivers flow to the sea to the sea, to the open arms of the sea. Lonely riverside, wait for me, wait for me. I'll be coming home, wait for me. By 1955, a few of the so-called R&B performers like Roy Hamilton could be heard occasionally on the white pop music stations. Some stations even devoted a segregated hour or so each day to the new musical phenomenon, while others programmed the increasingly popular cover records of R&B hits, whitewashed renditions of black music. But for the most part, rhythm and blues still was being told to stay in its place. Uh, rhythm and blues used to be called race music, mm -hmm. you see. And you didn't hear, you didn't hear a lot of it on the radio stations like you do now. You see that that was considered the garbage of the music. Uh, I'm not bitter now. Don't don't, don't oh, misunderstand no, no, me. No, but no, I'm no. just I'm just trying to show you that uh, uh, what can happen. Uh, this music was going on for years, but nobody paid any attention to it. Bo Diddley. And then we had this race thing hooked up in it. You know, and they didn't want any Negro records in their houses. This was a bad thing, man. You know. Like, and you can't fault them because this was put into them before they come all down the line, you know. So they tell the kids, look, you can't play that record in here, you know, like that's a bad scene, you know. This is what happened. So today everybody uh, has come out of that old funny bag and trying to, you know, what is a record? Yeah, man, what is, what, what is a record is a record, regardless of who made it, you know. Ain't nobody calling nobody no names on it. It's just music. Disc jockey Hunter Hancock. I think that a lot of the uh, white kids or Caucasian kids, uh, however you want to choose to call them, I think that a lot of them listen to my program to hear certain records that they could not hear on any other radio station. Now, I know they didn't like everything I played. I, I never did like everything I played. In fact, uh, I disliked most of the records I played. We really want to get down to it. But uh, I think they would listen to hear the records like, well, for instance, uh, G by the Crows and Shaboom by the Cards, a few of those records that helped start things off. Oh, 
You're listening to the Pop Chronicles. The neighborhood I lived in was like uh, Soul City, you know, USA, you know, <laughs> South Side of Chicago. The soulful Laura. like you can do for me, my baby. Hey, yeah. Look out, Chicago, here I come, yeah. A fleet of Mississippi river boats shuttled the first black New Orleans musicians to the big, bustling frontier city of Chicago when the century was only a few years old. By 1918, the occasional movement northwards had become a flood. By 1925, at the height of the Jazz Age, the Windy City was something like the musical capital of America. And by 1950, well then, the place was still jumping. some of the hippest blues clubs in the world, man. And, you know, I mean, like, if if the things that they were doing then could have been recorded, man, and played now, man, it would have been fantastic, you know, because I used to stand outside and listen because I couldn't go, I wasn't big enough to go inside. Mm -hmm. We could stand right out there in the alley, you know, under the window, you know, and hear the, hear the music coming out, man. Cats like B.B. King, man, who was one of the greatest, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, man, all these cats was playing in these places that I'm talking about, man. Like many of those who grew up in the neighborhood of 43rd and South Park, young Lou Rawls had gotten much of his early education, musical and otherwise, from the street. Naturally, kids running around the street, you know, and they didn't have nothing to do but run up and down the alleys in the streets and things, you know, and play. And we hear this music, man, and we would naturally, we'd stand out there, you know, and listen to be grooving on this music. We didn't know what was happening, you know, we'd hear the people in there having fun, laughing and talking. So it was just a groove, man, to stand there and listen to the music, man. And it would be, oh, listen, talking about funky. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, if that wouldn't have been a little lower, we couldn't have stood there. <laughs> they have a lot of rhythm on the south side. They don't have much else, but they've got rhythm. I was born and brought up in a kitchen at apartment, so naturally I can talk about that. Like dead in street, I can talk about that's truth. That ain't no mm -hmm. fiction. That's mm -hmm. all facts, man. Yeah, I'm not protesting. Too, right? You dig it? Uh, I'm not protesting against it. I, I, I always I make the statement, I'm so glad that I was there. I can say glad because I'm not there anymore. Mm -hmm. You dig mm -hmm. it? Uh, they say this is a big, rich town, but I live in the poorest part. In a city without a heart I learned to fight before I was six The only way I could get along uh, When you're raised on a daily street You gotta be tough and strong Now all the guys are no getting in trouble That's how it's always been When the odds are all against you How can you win? I'm gonna push my way out of here Even though I can't say when But I'm gonna get off of this dead end street And I ain't never gonna come back again Never No, no, no I'm gonna 
I'm gonna save my dough Get away from here I ain't gonna come back no more I'm tired of a daddy in street I wanna get out of the world and learn something You don't live in Chicago if you don't know how to take care of yourself. You know, if you don't, if, if you don't know, the kids there will teach you. <laughs> you know, they'll teach you right quick. Around the South Side, Ellis McDaniel was known as a pretty fair amateur boxer. He had compiled an impressive record as a teenager, 27 wins against only three losses. But there were some who thought he showed even greater promise with a guitar than with gloves. He had faced his first audience in a street corner when he was 12, leading a musical group comprised of two guitars and a washboard. Then we called ourselves the Langley Avenue Jive Cats. We played all the little clubs around. We won all the little amateur shows, and we won so much that we couldn't even get on any. Anytime we showed up, they, they wouldn't let us on, you know, because nobody else had a chance. Back in the boxing days, the kids around the neighborhood had given Ellis a nickname. They called him Bo Diddley, and it stuck. My mother once told me that there was a fellow that used to run around in Macomb, Mississippi, where I was born, that they used to call Bo Diddley. Now, I had never heard the name until the kids started calling me this, and I thought they were being funny. I thought it was something nasty, you know. And I still don't know, because the name is not in the dictionary. It was a long time before I figured out how to get the correct spelling for it. So we all, Leonard Chess and Phil Chess, we all got together and we figured out how to spell it. So this is the way we copyrighted it for me. Now when I was a little boy at the age of five I had something in my pocket keep a lot of folks alive now I'm a man May 21 you know baby we can have a lot of fun I'm a man, I spell M A N Man. The immigrant brothers Chess, Leonard and Phil, ran a small but profitable recording company called Chess Checker, headquartered on Chicago's East 49th. There, during the 50s, they were turning out some of the earthiest and most authentic blues sounds in all of R&B. Talented artists like Chuck Berry, Willie Maybon, and Sonny Boy Williamson literally wandered into the studios unannounced, brandishing their demonstration tapes or records and asking for an audition. I was looking for a job, you know, mm -hmm. and they had had that recording studio about a block and a half from me for maybe four or five years, and I didn't even know it. So then somebody, a fellow that I knew that had been putting nickels and dimes in the hat when we passed the hat on the street corners, he called Phil Chess and told him he wanted him to hear us. So we jumped in there and we played Bo Diddley and here I am. With his very first hit record, the song that bore his name, Bo Diddley created a guitar riff that was to have a resounding impact on American rock and roll in the 50s and British rock in the 60s. But the melody itself was frankly derivative. Well, there was a song called Hambone, done with the leg bit, you know, on the leg like that. But um, I says anybody can do anything with their hands like this. I am going to create something else. I'm going to put it in strings. And I kept fooling around with this thing until I got it right. When I stumble onto it, this one particular thing, I left it like that. I just turn off like turning off knobs. That's the end of the rope. You know, you can't go no further. Don't listen to the side, baby, diamond ring. If that diamond ring don't shine, he gonna take it to a private eye. Oh, dearly caught a nanny go. 
I'd rather say Bo Diddley is going to be your man. You know what I'm saying? See, because when I say I, another guy can get the record and play it for a girl. And it means him. But when I say me, and he get it and play it for it, 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 his name ain't Bo Diddley. <laughs> Won't you come to my house with black cat bones? I take my baby all the way from home. Mother that photo, where's he been? Up to your house and gone again. Oh, did the boat, did I have you heard? My pretty baby said she was a bird. In a moment, a preview of the next chapter in John Gilliland's The Pop Chronicles. I've been in Chicago, say something like, ever since I was 17 years old. But all this stuff, what I got, I brought it from Mississippi to Chicago. Next on The Pop Chronicles, the conclusion of the tribal drum, our survey of the American rhythm and blues scene in the early 50s, with special guests Jimmy Reed, John Lee Hooker, B.B. King, Howlin' Wolf, songwriters Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, and others. The Pop Chronicles, written, narrated, and produced by John Gilliland. Associate producer, Chester Coleman. Guests on this program in order of their appearance were Ahmet Ertigan, Smokey Robinson, Jackie Wilson, Ray Charles, Clara Ward, Mahalia Jackson, Roy Hamilton, Bo Diddley, Hunter Hancock, and Lou Rawls. The song Chronicles of Pop, written and sung by Len Chandler. Theme music, The Beat Goes On, performed by Vanilla Fudge. Your announcers, Tom Beck and Cy Holiday. Yeah.